Hello, uh, hello and welcome. Hello and welcome to this uh, episode of the Forward Thinkers Talk series. Uh, my name is Dr. Ivo Pezzuto. I'm a professor of economics and management and the founder of Ivo Pezzuto Forward Thinking Lab. Um, in this space, uh, we invite prominent and emerging entrepreneurs, company leaders, forward thinkers, uh, in order to share their thought provoking ideas and expertise on business, uh, emerging markets, trends, uh, technology, and sustainable business model. Uh, I'm very pleased today to have here with us uh, a great entrepreneur, um, CEO, and company leader, Lorenzo Carnelli. Lorenzo is the CEO, uh, member of the board of directors and shareholders of Freem. Uh, Freem is uh, an Italian company headquarters in Segrate Milan, specialized in the design and production of electrical converters for special applications. Uh, um, Lorenzo, thank you very much. Welcome and thank you very much for being here with us. Hello, Ivo. Thank you very much to you and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you again. So uh, Freem is a, a leading Italian company in the um, power con converters and in uh, this uh, uh, sector. Uh, Freem is a company with a, a long tradition, 70 years uh, of history, 70 year old uh, family business, uh, rapidly evolving and uh, um, pursuing bold and environmentally friendly growth strategies in the global electric energy converter market. So it's a very, um, very important uh, uh, industry for uh, the uh, the future and uh, Freem is a real leader so among one of the four leading companies uh, internationally in this uh, environment. And by the way, just to give some additional information about Freem, we could say that Freem is uh, an Italian company, but is also uh, uh, de facto born global, as we could call it, uh, enterprise, born global enterprise, since it has more than 90% of its revenues uh, uh, made abroad. So it's really uh, um, for foreign revenues, uh, uh, it's it's one of the big uh, uh, components of its uh, um, um, of, of its uh, of its business. The world uh, is a free marketplace uh, thanks to its international presence in uh, uh, various countries. You are you have uh, um, operations in twenty seven countries across five continents, uh, in addition to uh, subsidiaries uh, in, uh, in international markets. In particular, if I remember correctly. Freem operates uh, with headquarters in Italy, Freem Group SPA, but also um, you have uh, Freem America, uh, LTD, you have a Freem Latin, uh, Latin uh, and uh, uh, RLI, and you have a, a Freem in Chile, Freem Germany, and a commercial office in Indonesia. And also Freem has uh, uh, recently um, uh, um, taken over uh, did acquisition in the United States uh, with, of a company called uh, um, uh, Dan Hamp Group, a uh, manufacturer of, a, of a, um, the current system, and uh, uh, other um, collaborations uh, and uh, uh, with company like TC Consultoris and also FNF, uh, a joint venture with the Seri Group uh, uh, and, and others. I think more recently, You've had also a very interesting partnership on the grid hydrogen production with a company called uh, uh, Backfee, which is a world leader for hydrogen production and distribution equipment, uh, and particularly, particularly providing power supply units. So it's a lot of stuff, real leader in this uh, uh, area and a real um, uh, powerhouse for, uh, for what it matters uh, uh, regarding the um, production of high current rectifiers necessary for the electrolysis processes and uh, uh, the production of uh, power converters uh, um, for, you know, to supply big and mid-sized electrolyzers for the green hydrogen production. So you're a big player in the uh, hydrogen production. And uh, um, if I remember correctly, the mission uh, of the company revolves around utilizing uh, renewable energy sources uh, such as wind and solar power to generate electricity for the electrolysis process. So this is a very interesting thing. And um, final thing, your main business lines include power converters for hydrogen electrolysis, power converters for fuel cells, 
BV, battery electronic vehicles recharging infrastructures for e-mobility, and battery energy storage systems, and uh, also energy conversion system, system integration, and after sales support and service. So I said a lot of stuff. Now, going to the specific question, um, Lorenzo, let me ask you this thing. Uh, it's amazing uh, the story of your company, how you're bringing uh, uh, forward this uh, uh, important uh, mission, especially in a, in a strategic industry for the future of uh, Italy, Europe, and the world. Uh, your family company, Lorenzo 3M, has been ranked among top companies globally in the current rectifiers and large electro electrolytic industry and a re relevant player in the green hydrogen supply chain. Uh, can you explain to us how did a medium-sized firm uh, became, how did it become an uh, emerging international player in the electrical converter industry and more recently in the fast growing green hydrogen market? How did it make, how did you make it to turn this business and something so important, so strategic uh, in uh, uh, your strategic choices? Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you, first of all, for introducing Freem and introducing myself. Um, let's say the, the answer to your question is uh, um, mainly in, in what you already introduced. So mainly uh, our positioning today is based on, on the history uh, of our company. Uh, so uh, the, um, the market we are working uh, in, we are involved in uh, is, uh, let's say, a niche market. So we talk about uh, uh, the energy conversion, so the, the power converter, what are called the power converter, um, but uh, the power converter for the uh, big industrial electrolysis processes. This has been our history. So we talk about uh, the big chemical plants, uh, mainly the chloralkali plants, uh, producing the basic chemicals like chlorine, chlorate, and so on. And then uh, uh, the, this kind of processes includes even the electrolytic refining of uh, uh, non-ferrous metals. So the, the refining of copper, zinc, aluminum, and so on, plus other special applications uh, that are requiring, let's say, big uh, or special power converters. So uh, in this very specific business, um, 3M has really focused uh, during the history, so really starting from the 50s. And so uh, thanks to, to this really specializ specialization, we have been able uh, to, uh, you know, gain uh, year after year our uh, market share that we have today. Of course, uh, the last uh, years, uh, in the last years, we have been uh, trying to, to push a lot for the growth uh, internationally, as, as you mentioned. But let's say it's, it's really a long path that started more than 70 years ago. And then, uh, so th this is to mention uh, that uh, for us uh, uh, today being number uh, three or number four in this very niche or specific market is really a, a job that started uh, my grandfather in the 50s and that we, we are just, you know, improving uh, in the last years and uh, with, uh, you know, ambitious targets because we, we, are, aiming to, we are aiming to become uh, number one or number two in this, in this business. Um, and then, uh, uh, let's say, how we have been able to achieve this, as mentioned, being really focused on, on such a niche market. So trying to make the, um, a perfect alignment among the uh, main requirements of this business and uh, the values of our company. Uh, so uh, the values of our company are uh, responsibility, uh, passion, uh, quality, and sustainability. And uh, all, all these are uh, really um, necessary, or I would say even mandatory, if you want to be successful in this specific market, because we make special equipment, but we make uh, uh, those kind of equipments that are maybe not very big in value compared to the value of the complete plant of the complete system, uh, because typically our uh, equipment uh, is in the range of maybe 
10%, 15% of the value of, of the complete plant investment. So it's, let's say, a small value, but uh, uh, it's uh, uh, a very important brick because uh, from, from our equipment depends directly even the, the, the production. And so if our equipment stops, you stop a complete line of production of a chemical plant. And so this is, let's say, anyway, a key or a critical equipment. And so uh, our values uh, like responsibility and quality uh, means uh, uh, reliability uh, towards our customers. And so this uh, has been uh, a key factor, a key differentiating factor of 3M compared to, uh, to other competitors. And uh, from this point of view, uh, our main competitors are uh, big, big multinational companies, much, much bigger than 3M, but are all companies that have, let's say, similar uh, positioning in terms of quality and market approach, prop just to confirm that this is really a key, a key factor. So this uh, a matching between uh, the value of the company and, uh, and the market requirements have been, uh, I think, uh, a, a strong, strong background and a strong basis of our success, and still, it's something on which we are leveraging in in our growth today. And how we have been able to transfer this, uh, uh, let's say, in in the energy transition, uh, you you already mentioned. So uh, mainly because the the part uh, of the uh, energy transition that we selected as our a field uh, of, of focus uh, is the green hydrogen, as you mentioned. So green hydrogen is produced by electrolysis. Uh, and so it's exactly, let's say, the same kind of process uh, that you can find, of course, uh, chemical-wise is, is different, but it's, the, the approach is the same, uh, that you can find in the other uh, sectors I, I mentioned before. So yeah. there is really a, a kind of... Uh, uh, um, synergic similarity uh, between our traditional industrial business and uh, the um, green hydrogen. Yeah, thank you very much. That's that's very very insightful, very useful. Thank you for for explaining this part and uh, uh, the mission and the passion and the commitment. And by the way. Uh, we hear a lot today um, this uh, uh, focus, this strategic focus on green uh, transition, on sustainability, sustainable energies, and uh, green hydrogen in particular uh, as a major contributors uh, for the decarbonization of various uh, energy intensive uh, industry and sectors, uh, uh, including, uh, of course, transportation, industrial manufacturing, uh, power generations, and many others that are highly energy intensive. So uh, your company is actually pursuing these goals uh, and providing innovating solutions uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, converters, uh, 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 electrolyzers, but also energy storages and other stuff, working also on an EV uh, charging system. So um, the, the question that I uh, would like to ask you, now it's very big, this thing of the green, uh, uh, hydrogen and the transition, what motivated you and your organizations to fully embrace the transition to green hydrogen way before others? You know, you've been uh, really uh, anticipating this trend a few years before. And uh, more in general, your commitment to sustainability, you know, uh, what really made you believe that the green hydrogen would be uh, the future, you know, would be the strategic choice for the future of our industries and for your company and uh, as one of the most uh, important renewable, renewable, renewable energy sources of, of the future. Uh, how did it all start? Uh, uh, why did you make this decision, you and your team? Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, um, I think it's important to mention that uh, the, the main, the key decision that we did uh, was uh, uh, to have a, a, a part of the business of 3M uh, connected or devoted to the energy transition. This was our decision back in, uh, uh, let's say, late 2017, beginning of 2018. Um, 3M is manufacturing power converters and 
uh, just the definition of energy transition means that uh, power converters are for sure involved in or can be involved in different ways, in different matters, in, in, in different applications as well. Uh, so our target was okay, we have our industrial business and we are doing well and we have still space to grow and that's what we are doing, but uh, to really have uh, a, a vision about the future of the company, but in the next decades, uh, uh, really we decided uh, to move towards the energy transition. Uh, and so started a very, let's say, uh, interesting uh, uh, period of time because we started uh, our company small, but uh, compared to the size of the company, we had even some financial, let's say, capabilities. So we started making some small investments in, in different fields in the energy transition. So you mentioned uh, the battery energy storage systems, uh, you mentioned as well the electric mobility and so on. And so we started investing with some startups, some activities, uh, developing some products. And, and this, honestly, uh, each and every of these business, uh, of these businesses uh, have really huge potential growth. Uh, each and every analysis, market analysis is showing that these markets are going to be huge uh, in the next years. Uh, but uh, here comes, let's say, the, the, the second decision that we had to do, the first one, okay, free and must be in the energy transition. And the second one was, okay, we have to select, since we have limited resources, we have to select, uh, let's say, one primary business that uh, is going to be our strategic business together with our traditional business. And this was the green hydrogen, as, as you anticipated. Um, so uh, at the end of 2020, uh, after having had already some experiences in that in that business, um, we decided the green hydrogen to be our strategic uh, target. Um, how the, the decision came? Um, honestly, it, it, it came uh, as uh, I anticipated before. So, uh, commenting that uh, the uh, green hydrogen production is a kind of production that is closer to our market. And so uh, for Freem, the uh, opportunity was closer and uh, the, let's say, uh, the possibility to, to be successful, of course, were higher compared to maybe other, other uh, businesses. And this, uh, and this was really the decision. Then uh, the fact that green hydrogen is going to be a, let's say, a driver. Uh, of course, I, if, if you wish, Ivo, of course, I can I can tell and so on, but honestly, it's it's not me. Are, there are several studies and analysis that are, let's say, explaining how green hydrogen is involved in the energy transition. And uh, I I just, uh, let's say, uh, gave you, uh, let's say, the path that, that we followed in the last years just to define that uh, green hydrogen is, uh, uh, is our uh, strategic target today. We have... Uh, um, is saying, let's say, in, inside Freem, uh, what we call a motto that is uh, um, uh, in, in innovation or evolution through continuity. Okay, so uh, because uh, uh, in order to be successful uh, in, uh, uh, in, in this new business, of course, we, from the very beginning, we decided that, that uh, we had to leverage our experience, our values, uh, and our capabilities. And so uh, this is strictly in connection to the, uh, the decision of being in, in the green hydrogen. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's very, very so exciting. Which leads me to the next uh, uh, question I wanted to ask is uh, basically, um, you know, uh, what, uh, um, <clears throat> what are the capabilities uh, uh, and uh, unique uh, um, you know, competencies and uh, the drivers that brought you to this uh, innovation model that you are defining, uh, embracing the green transition and the green hydrogen in particular. And uh, it was coming to my mind that probably from what you were saying, it's very likely that you have, you're combining, you know, sort of a market pool uh, innovation from the demand and market for green sustainable uh, um, energy solutions, uh, green hydrogen and 
others, but also uh, uh, core competences, core capabilities uh, at the company, which allow this uh, um, real this match, you know, to 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 close the gap and to find this match for uh, a competitive advantage that you have in this uh, in this uh, uh, domain, this in these uh, technologies, and the ability to match the market uh, emerging market trends, uh, and uh, together with uh, the um, key core comp- competencies and capabilities. Uh, and mission of the organization. In this sense, uh, I was wondering, um, do you, um, in, in particular, I was wondering if you are uh, considering um, this uh, this model, and uh, um, you know, uh, this 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 model is uh, driving uh, also. You said e-mobility, circular economy, and other uh, practices. So, more in particular. Uh, how is the free and business model and value chain um, integrated in the broader green hydrogen supply chain network at the national and European level, international level? We know that these days we hear a lot about, uh, uh, you know, um, the Italian and the Mediterranean role, key role in uh, um, the green hydrogen, um, uh, basically, supply chain. Uh, hub. It's a strategic for Europe, for uh, Northern Africa, for uh, uh, the European uh, um, the, the energy strategy of the future. So, uh, um, and your company has a central role, a central position in the value chain, both in the power to gas and gas to power processes. And I was wondering, in particular, uh, how do you see this thing? You know, what's what what? what how do you see uh, your um, your company? Uh, role in uh, the value chain, uh, um, the integrated value chain, of uh, green hydrogen value chain in Italy, in Europe, uh, uh, now and moving forward in uh, in the years to come, the national, international level. Where do you see this going? Now we know that Italy has mm-hmm. a central location in, uh, uh, in the Mediterranean, um, making making it an ideal uh, location uh, to become a hub for the hydrogen trade. So um, many analysts argue that uh, uh, you know a decentralized power grid with the flexible uh, electrolyzers could provide a viable solution in the, in the future to scale up the system. What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, <clears throat> so it's a uh, uh, let's say um, a, a, a kind of uh, a discussion that uh, uh, brings uh, even to strategic consideration about. Uh, the role of uh, Italy and Europe in general. Um, so I, I would start from this. I was uh, uh, this morning in a, in a conference in Asso Lombarda here in, in, in the downtown of Milan, and there was a presentation of uh, a report uh, done by ISPI, uh, that is a research institute, uh, talking about, the, the, let's say, the global uh, situation and the expectation for next year. But <clears throat> it, it, the main points that are, that are coming out are, uh, you know, uh, the, the first point is connected to energy. So uh, electric energy is uh, anyway a driver today for each and every economy. Uh, and so there is uh, uh, the necessity of becoming more and more independent uh, from, from the energy point of view uh, if you want to have a, a competitive industrial uh, environment. Um, in Italy, of course, we have a very bad starting point because we have zero uh, resources in terms of uh, gas, oil, and so on. But uh, uh, as you mentioned, we can have uh, a, a good, a positive uh, position if we t- if we think about renewable energies and if we think about even hydroelectric uh, energy uh, that is another uh, renewable source. So if you think about solar, wind, and hydro, uh, Italy can. Uh, uh, really improve a lot uh, its uh, competitiveness, uh, industrial competitiveness, uh, com- considering the energy uh, production point of view. Uh, this uh, can be, of course, extended to some other areas in, uh, in, in Europe. So basically, the renewables today, my thinking, and it's not only my thinking, there were even some other uh, uh, entrepreneurs or let's say managers or whatever that are uh, 
really considering that the renewables can provide an alternative um, uh, positioning to those countries that uh, do not have uh, uh, oil and gas, like Italy and like other, ca other countries in Europe. So I think uh, this must be a strategic way to move, uh, uh, to move forward. Uh, there are other opportunities. We know very well France uh, uh, with the nuclear. Uh, this is a clear sample. So just to sustain their industry or their competitiveness, they have invested in nuclear. Right or wrong, I, now I don't care, but uh, it is to explain that this is the target. Uh, and this can be a great background uh, to leverage then the energy transition that uh, uh, you were mentioning before, uh, because to decarbonize uh, our industry, our energy and, and everything, uh, of course, uh, renewables are the first, uh, the first step. Uh, so in this case, we would have two main benefits. Uh, first one, improving our competitiveness in, in, in the energy field, and the second, uh, moving uh, quickly, fast, uh, and strongly uh, towards the energy transition. And then the, the second, the second consi consideration is uh, on the industrial level. So as uh, uh, we consider, let's say, uh, the energy transition an opportunity for Freem, uh, mainly for the future of Freem to grow and to, and to be, uh, let's say, healthy and sustainable for the next decades. So thinking about uh, 2040, 2050 and so on, uh, we decided to look and, 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 and to invest in the energy transition. Uh, the same approach is, is what Euro the European uh, Union has been trying to, to set up. Uh, in this in this sense, uh, uh, I think it was really great uh, to hear the European uh, community moving forwards this uh, uh, energy transition in, in a strong way, because uh, I really think this can be an opportunity uh, for the European industry to find a place for for the future. Okay, uh, really an industrial positioning. Uh, based on this uh, on this kind of let's say business, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. let's say in 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 a very large scale, uh, the, the same thing that we decided for Freem, I believe, uh, should be a driver for Europe uh, as well. Uh, the, 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 so this, I think, should be the position of uh, of uh, Europe. Uh, so really, being a leader in these fields. Uh, uh, in terms of new technologies, new uh, uh, new ways, and, and the application of the technologies, which which is another key key point, of course, and um, the the main uh, the main issue today is uh, uh, how to do it. Absolutely, absolutely. And by the way, thank you, thank you for this uh, insightful detail. So you basically say the roadmap is clear, you know. Uh, for Freem and for the other companies uh, at national and international level on this industrial policy, on this, uh, uh, you know, uh, energy strategy to uh, compete globally, to improve the competition uh, globally uh, and to have a, affordable uh, energy costs and abundant for the future uh, in order to compete with other uh, important uh, um, uh, players in the world like the U.S., China and other big players in the um, in, in the global uh, in that. Of course, we learned uh, uh, the hard way uh, in, the, in the last couple of years with the energy uh, problems we had, uh, you know, following the, the, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. We learned the hard way uh, uh, with the, you know, pressures and difficulties in uh, sourcing energy and whatever. We learned our way that, uh, um, Energy is, is a key component for uh, competitiveness in industrial production. It, it impacts on the cost, so there is also uh, uh, implications for uh, uh, inflation uh, and so on. So that's definitely something we learn how critical it is. Uh, efficient uh, energy for competing, and in this sense, the national, international, so supranational energy transition plans, uh, Europe and uh, is uh, is moving is, is uh, you know moving forward. Uh, are definitely uh, very important for the decarbonization and the transition, the whole 
uh, uh, goal of climate neutrality by 2050. And we know that uh, we've seen uh, recently what an uh, incredible impact these uh, policies are having on both sides of the ocean in the US with the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which is actually encouraging a lot of investments in uh, uh, renewables, and also in Europe uh, with the European uh, Repower EU Plan, the, the EU Green Deal Industrial Plan, and so on. And all those uh, tax incentives, the regulatory aspects, uh, uh, regulated asset based models, contracts for difference and carbon credits, and everything that goes with that. Uh, so, the, the thing I was wondering is, uh, on this matter, uh, and thank you already for introducing this point. Uh, are this policy and plan, uh, according to you now at the European level, supercharging the economic growth model for the future, uh, uh, providing a smooth, a scalable, and sustainable transition to climate neutrality? And uh, will be uh, Europe able to thrive in the years to come and to compete, to withstand comp global competition from other blocks? Uh, are EU companies timely building adequate infrastructures, including storage, to support rapid expansion of renewables, uh, reduce carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas uh, emissions, and achieve a leadership position internationally, or while still falling behind, we still have to do more. There's a lot more investments to be done uh, to overcome some uh, constraints and regulatory uh, limitations. Uh <clears throat> let's say uh, the, 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 the first uh, um, or the immediate answer for me uh, would be uh, yes, uh, I, I believe that uh, uh, Europe can, uh, uh, can be a, a major player, as said before, uh, in, uh, uh, in approaching this, uh, let's say, uh, part of the energy transition as uh, an industrial opportunity. Uh, because, uh, uh, okay, Freem is just uh, one sample, but there are a lot of companies in Italy and, and in Europe that are really um, world leader uh, in several uh, key parts of different uh, uh, business in the energy transition. Um, in the green hydrogen, uh, I can mention today, but really the, the, the main... Uh, uh, especially in the production of green hydrogen, that is our let's say main main target today. Uh, not only free, but there are really uh, main uh, worldwide players are European. Uh, so the answer is yes. Uh, it's a it's a matter of uh, um, investments, as you mentioned. And uh, these, of course, are playing uh, a, a key role, especially at the beginning uh, of a new, a completely new business like green hydrogen. Uh, because uh, uh, whichever investment today in the green hydrogen is not self-sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so you have really to uh, allow this business, if you believe in the business, you have really to allow the business to, uh, to grow and to reach a point in which it is going to be self-sustainable. And um, so the subsidies. European Union, yeah, incentives and subsidies must be there. The European Union uh, put, uh, of course, a lot of uh, money there, um, but you you already mentioned the US uh, uh, did even uh, <laughs> something something more um, with the IRA that you mentioned, uh, but even before with the BIL, uh, they they really. Uh, tried to, uh, let's say, set up or reshore, let's say, uh, a, a lot of the industrial production inside the country. Uh, European Union, honestly, has done uh, has done good steps, uh, but uh, has has been the uh, the first mover on this field. Mm -hmm. uh, so this has been great, uh, yeah. but uh, still we are lacking today, I think, uh, um, on one side, maybe some power in, in the kind of investment, mm -hmm. uh, but the main issue is uh, related to the policies, because mm -hmm. investment without policies uh, in something that is new is, you cannot, you cannot move on. Uh, not only Europe has got uh, troubles in, in doing these policies, and so in allowing this new business to, to develop and 
by the way, to, to leverage the incentives uh, that should be provided to, 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 to really to put it on the ground. Um, but European Union, Union is not uh, the only one that is striving with, with this issue. Uh, mm -hmm. In the US, uh, is, uh, is, let's say, is exactly the same. So uh, uh, I think uh, uh, who is going to not only to put more money, but really uh, who will be able to find the right uh, policies uh, in order to uh, let this business grow uh, will be uh, or will have uh, a, a competitive advantage mm -hmm. compared to, to the others. Europe has started earlier and uh, we, we can do it. Uh, let's say that, so, and, and as I was saying, I think we have uh, several uh, leaders in Europe that can re even support this kind of business and this kind of growth. But uh, the European Union uh, is not really famous for for being, you know, very fast and, and smart then in, uh, uh, in finalizing the policies. And this is uh, uh, a little bit, let's say, worrying. Why? While usually the US are, you know, pretty, pretty straight. Uh, of course, of course, of course. Uh... Uh, Europe uh, have been 27 countries uh, <laughs> with the exit of the UK. Of course, make, uh, finding an agreement that's definitely, uh, uh, by definition, more complex than a single country with uh, uh, a more, uh, you know, unified, centralized uh, control in many ways, uh, currency, language, uh, 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 federate uh, state, you know. So uh, definitely Europe, because of its... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, um, configuration and uh, it, inevitably it's uh, it's it's a bit more uh, uh, articulated. Uh, so yeah, I agree with you very much. And getting getting back to this point of the incentives and the and the um, support and sustaining of this uh, transition, um, what role do you think uh, green finance, sustainable finance, uh, uh, impact, uh, uh, social responsible investments, SRI? are playing, uh, according to you, uh, in uh, supporting growth uh, strategies towards uh, green hydrogen expansion goals and climate neutrality targets more in general. Uh, how, how important do you think is the contribution of uh, 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 this uh, uh, green uh, uh, investing and institutional investors, you know, venture capital equity funds, to support, uh, you know, public-private uh, contribution to the firm scalable long-term growth strategy to a more resilient uh, uh, um, growth model for this uh, um, uh, transition. I know that uh, uh, um, in particular your company has also uh, relied on uh, important uh, contribution on this side, uh, Fondo Investimento Italiano SGR, which is part of uh, Casa Deposite Prestiti, owned by the Italian Ministry of Econom Economy and Finance, and other institutions are also uh, uh, have also invested in, in your company, and uh, and uh, basically um, Freem has uh, uh, relied also on this uh, uh, support for the acquisition of the uh, Dai and M and MP LLC in the U.S. And uh, so, do you see in general? this green and sustainable finance uh, as a key uh, booster, a key contributor for the expansion of uh, this, uh, um, you know, project uh, of uh, internationalization and uh, uh, sustainability uh, in, 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 in this space. Is this a, a key role, you know, private and public finance, sustainable finance as key drivers for the future of decarbonization and sustainable uh, investments? Yeah, um, going towards let's say the uh, the private investment, uh, um, the the role is going to be critical. Uh, I totally agree with let's say with you on this. Uh, let's say the the from this point of view, the uh, the main uh, um, uh, target is uh, how it is becoming then, let's say, sustainable uh, in sense of an investment. Uh, so uh, going towards these uh, uh, new challenges, uh, it's, uh, uh, it can be, uh, of 
course difficult and requires investment and so on. And so even a, a, a company like Freem decided to really get stronger involving an institutional partner, like you mentioned, Fondi Italiano di Investimenti. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very important that uh, a company can rely on this kind of support in order to make new investment and leverage this opportunity for growing. Uh, the, the, the critical part here uh, can be how really this uh, return of investments are going to be sustainable and uh, not only if, because in some fields, um, let's say you are at uh, such uh, an initial stage that uh, you are not even sure that this kind of business or business model are go is going to be successful from a financial or economical point of view. Uh, and, and, and there are several, several, several uh, samples uh, in, in this sense, uh, for example, in the renewables and so on. So we have been working several years in the mini grid systems. And honestly, the main issue there was really to make the project sustainable from the financial and economical point of view. And it was almost most of the time, this was really the critical part. <laughs> so technology is there, everything is there, but if it is not self-sustaining economically, uh, the private investment uh, are going to be anyway limited. Um, yeah. And uh, so there is this kind of first, let's say, selection to be done. Um, the second part is, as I mentioned, connected to the, or depending uh, to the time that is required because these kind of businesses are starting. Uh, of course, we believe in the green hydrogen. And so we are confident that the green hydrogen today is still a, a market, even though a very, very small market and tomorrow it will grow, but it will take years and years. And from this point of view, um, some, yeah. let's say, private financial institutions uh, maybe are not compatible uh, yeah because they look to a much shorter term. So if you look at the three or five years yeah. uh, term, probably it's, yeah. it's too short. Uh, you have to think maybe from five to 10 years to really see big growth or uh, return because you, you can have big growth, but in the meanwhile, you even uh, have a, a big investment. And so- No, no, I, <laughs> I, 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 I understand. Balance. Well, so basically what you're saying is that you need patient money. You need a, a patient investor for a number of years because it takes a certain time of period before you can get a real uh, um, robust return uh, on investment, but also probably because of strategic reasons. You know, here we're talking about energy industry. So it's something that's also very important for uh, strategic sectors. And so uh, in that sense, the, the public uh, in, uh, fund could, be, uh, could have an important role. Uh, because can of I, this I, aspect. Yeah, Ivo, sorry. J just uh, then, let's say, uh, if, if you look about, uh, if, if you look, for example, at the stock exchange and the stock market, you see that several companies that are uh, involved in uh, energy transition or in green hydrogen, uh, maybe they have anyway important valuation on the market, even though they are losing money every year. So, uh, mm -hmm. of course, uh, there is even a kind of, of let's say, of return uh, that is not only depending, let's say, on, uh, on the revenues or on the BTDA, but <laughs> it's really uh, looking at the expectation that this will happen in the future. Uh, so uh, this was even to give another another point that you can have uh, a, maybe a company that is uh, investing and losing but losing money at the end of the year. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you have a strong valuation and maybe strong capitalization. Absolutely, absolutely. No, yeah, I understand. I and I understand the 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 decision. You know, for your company to have a fee tech, uh, uh, which is uh, basically. Uh, Staken the minority stake in free, I'm sure, capital mm -hmm. for the acquisition of Diane uh, Dian P in the US, this part of the Fondi Italiano uh, Investment SGR, and uh, uh, to allow you and the company to strengthen its position in the industrial commercial competitive position in the strategic market of the US. And, uh, um, but the, apparently, 
uh, uh, recent research indicates uh, uh, that uh, from McKinsey that uh, cl clean hydrogen has the potential to decarbonize a whole host of industries, including aviation, fertilizer, long haul tracking, uh, tracking mar maritime uh, shipping, refining steel, uh, some of the uh, worst uh, emitters of greenhouse gases, and the still according to the same. Uh, uh, a consulting firm hydrogen could contribute to more than 20% annual global uh, emission reduction uh, by 2050 and uh, could also uh, contribute uh, green hydrogen uh, to reducing production cost uh, by approximately 50% by 2030. How do you feel about this? Uh, this would give the scalability of green hydrogen to make it cost effective, uh, hopefully in the medium term, uh, um, understanding now you need the subsidies, incentives, tax breaks to uh, make this industry, infant industry grow very fast. Yeah, so uh, let's say how, how to, uh, to achieve these, uh, uh, these targets uh, depends uh, um, heavily from, from the policies uh, that, that we mentioned before, um, because of course are the policies that then are driving uh, uh, which target uh, you can reach and how fast you can reach those, those targets. So uh, in Europe, we set up really uh, stringent targets, which is, I think, positive. Now we have uh, to sustain uh, the, uh, the reaching of, of these targets. Um, the, 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 the sector that you mentioned in which green hydrogen is going to be involved are what, what are called the hard to abate uh, sectors, those in which you cannot go directly uh, with maybe um, renewable energies, but you knew you use hydrogen as an energy vector uh, in order to decarbonize these uh, these processes or part of these processes. Uh, the The market, from this point of view, will will move uh, in uh, in different steps because uh, some of this decarbonization can be applied uh, even in, uh, in in the short term. Uh, for example, in refineries, uh, because uh, in or in those, let's say, uh, applications where hydrogen is already used today uh, in this process, several processes, you use what is called uh, uh, gray hydrogen, okay, that you can uh, uh, produce uh, from oil or gas. Uh, but uh, for the production requires a huge amount of CO2 emission, mm -hmm. really a huge amount. And so if you are able to substitute this hydrogen that is already uh, used in these processes with green hydrogen mm -hmm. that is produced without emission of CO2, mm -hmm. uh, you can start really decarbonizing these processes. And so this is going to be the first, let's say, uh, stage uh, in the green hydrogen. And then, and this will apply, uh, as I say, for example, in refineries, mm -hmm. uh, the cement production, uh, and even in uh, um, uh, in, uh, in in the steel in the steel production. Uh, other uh, fields are going to be, uh, a, a, let's say, uh, an opportunity for the uh, hydrogen as energy vector, like you were saying, logistic, like. Uh, shipping and uh, uh, long uh, distance uh, tracking and so on. Uh, this probably will require a little bit more time as well as other applications will, re will require a little bit more time because uh, you not only need to develop, let's say, a sustainable green hydrogen, but you have to develop the, uh, let's say, uh, the process uh, itself or the technology itself in, in this business. Uh, and so this will require longer, let's say, a longer time and uh, higher uh, investment. The uh, basic ground is uh, anyway depending on renewable energies. So the, the, the first uh, uh, comment done on uh, having renewable energies uh, and being able even to have uh, energy independency is going to be crucial even in applying uh, uh, the green hydrogen uh, into the into the industry because uh, uh, the main cost uh, 
in, in terms of OPEX, so operational cost, uh, the main cost uh, for green hydrogen production is uh, electric energy. So as far as we will be able to have uh, uh, competitive or cheap uh, electric energy, renewable energy, uh, uh, then we will be able to have uh, uh, cheap and, and, uh, and competitive green hydrogen. And so is is always the same, let's say, uh, uh, discussion that we did before. Uh, we, in, in Europe, we start uh, having some important projects. Uh, so uh, especially in green hydrogen, um, there are already some, some application projects that are on the industrial scale, uh, which is a, a good... Uh, uh, feedback and, and it is a good opportunity. Uh, in some of the major projects, Freem is involved for for providing its uh, its power converters. And in this case, uh, are maybe big multinational companies uh, starting to decarbonize, a, for example, a refinery in in the north uh, of Europe, making this huge plant for uh, green hydrogen and. Uh, the electric energy are, are mainly coming from uh, wind power in this case. Uh, there is another uh, major project uh, for the production of green steel. Uh, this is always in the Nordic uh, uh, countries. And in this case, the energy will come from hydro. So yeah. just to give you a sample that, yes, uh, it's, it's feasible. You have some application in which hydrogen is already there. So you can just take out uh, uh, gray hydrogen and put green hydrogen you must have a green, green hydrogen uh, and, and to have it today, you, the, the main, uh, let's say, restriction uh, mm -hmm. is uh, given by having the uh, renewable energy available uh, in such a quantity at, uh, and uh, at a um, competitive price. Absolutely. Tom. Thank you very much. This is very useful. Uh, by the way, uh, Lorenzo, uh, which sector, according to you, um, or international market, do you think uh, uh, will have, it's likely to have most benefit from uh, uh, transition to green and renewable energies and uh, sources in years to come? You, you operate and you, del you serve many sectors and industrial sectors. You mentioned chemicals, so it could be others. Uh, where do you see, uh, which sector you see might have the best benefit in terms of green and renewable, not just in Europe, but maybe more internationally. And also, how close are we really to reaching a tipping point uh, in terms uh, of uh, economies of scale, like cost effectiveness, more in general, competitiveness uh, in the use of these renewable and sustainable energy versus fossil fuels, uh, um, with or without government subsidies, but subsidies, but in this period, of course, we said, Clearly, on both sides of the oceans, everywhere, subsidies and incentives are important. Uh, um, and which of these uh, renewable resources um, are more likely to become really scalable and abundant? Uh, also, uh, uh, they can get enough storage uh, uh, and to be, um, you know, uh, not too expensive, uh, sustainable. I'm thinking about what we mentioned, you know, solar energy onshore, offshore wind energy, green hydrogen, geothermal energy, bioenergy, hydro, power energy, ocean energy, and so on. Can we really expect all of this or some of these or, multi, or many of these alternative energy sources to complement one another in a sort of energy mix, uh, uh, optimal energy mix of the future? Or do you expect one to be more dominant than the others uh, the trajectory in the years to come? Um, this sense... Uh, for example, we hear about deep sea exploration, space resource exploration, next generation uh, nuclear reactors like the SRM, you know, small new modular reactors. These seem to be to great gain greater attention uh, as a, a viable and safe, stable power source for mitigating climate change, uh, achieving global decarbonization in years to come. And the last thing I want to ask is pink eyed is is a the pink hydrogen, pink hydrogen meaning uh, uh, the hydrogen produced via electrolysis of water using nuclear power, uh, somehow uh, competing uh, with the green hydrogen in the future, or the two things they can get together. You know, they have the, the, the nuclear and uh, green are also uh, getting uh, into the perimeter of the EU taxonomy on environmentally sustainable economic activities uh, by the European Commission. So. 
do you see this all moving forward mm, with the same chance of uh, uh, generating uh, 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 optimal energy mix in the future? Or are we going to see one winner, some losers, or more winning uh, uh, solutions? Uh, uh, for example, nuclear, uh, small nuclear modular reactors uh, uh, and green hydrogen to be probably the best, uh, uh, to have the best opportunity in the future. So it's a, it's it's a, a very complex a yes, yeah. scenario. No, the, uh, of, of course, I'm not the, uh, the, the, the best expert uh, in, in terms of energy. Uh, my vision is that, uh, let's say, there is not uh, uh, the perfect source of energy that uh, is going to be just one and the only one. But of course, it will always be a matter of energy mix as it had been and it will be, uh, unless uh, in, I don't know, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years or something, maybe uh, will come fusion, a nuclear fusion or something like that. But still, it's a kind of scenario that is very difficult to be, uh, uh, to be envisioned today. Uh, so yes, of course, there will be a mix. Um, the mix uh, is going to be dependent on, on the competitiveness of each and every uh, source, uh, energy source in that specific area or in that specific condition. And in, from this point of view, uh, the renewable energies based on solar and wind already demonstrated to be absolutely competitive in several areas in the world or in several, in several conditions. Uh, and uh, uh, let's say, uh, not uh, uh, considering the hydro energy that... Uh, has been competitive since, uh, let's say, <laughs> centuries, not, not only decades. So from this point of view, uh, renewable energies can be competitive. And uh, um, I, I think it's going to be a source of mix that will depend uh, from what is available and so what uh, will make sense to be more developed and so on. Uh, in terms of mix, it will be even necessary because of the source itself, renewable, is uh, um, not continuous, as, as, as you commented before. And so probably it will always be anyway uh, a plus or, or a necessity to have a different mix, because uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, you can not only maximize, let's say, the production and the cost uh, uh, of production of the, of, of, of the energy, but you will even optimize uh, uh, the availability of energy during uh, all the day or all the year, and uh, uh, and so in this in this sense, even the cost of the infrastructure and the management of energy. But uh, my thinking is today uh, it, it's a mix. Tomorrow will always be a mix, a mix that will move step by step towards the renewables because of we what we we discussed today. Uh, mainly, my, my dream is uh, uh, mainly giving more and more independence to Italy and Europe in terms of uh, energy, energy production. Um, in terms of, uh, let's say, pink hydrogen, of course, this is uh, an invention from France because they have nuclear energy and so uh, they decided to have... Uh, um, green, uh, let's say, hydrogen produced with uh, nuclear energy, and they say, okay, it's pink. Uh, uh, honestly, I'm, I don't want to say if uh, pink is close to green or not. Okay. <laughs> this is, uh, I'm not very good in colors, let's say, so <laughs> I leave this to someone else. Uh, my comment uh, uh, comes back to, to, to what we discussed before. We need policies to, to manage this. Right. We need policies that must, must balance. And uh, so can pink hydrogen be com competitive? Yes, but depends from the policy. If, uh, uh, if you put different valuation or different incentives, if it is pink, uh, green, blue, gray, this will define what will really develop uh, in the future or not. Uh, I'm more worried I'm much, much more worried, not what, let's say, remains within Europe, uh, because 
you mentioned before, for example, we have a collaboration with McPhee, that is a French French company, and they are doing the electrolyzer for green hydrogen. That's fine. So uh, if France is developing is developing this business, anyway, there are opportunities for all Europe to grow. And perhaps we have uh, this kind of agreements even with other, let's say, manufacturer of electrolyzer. So that's fine. I'm much more worried about how the, the policy, uh, the European policies are allowing the European supply chain, the European industry to be and become a major player in the worldwide business because th okay. this is going to be the target. Mm -hmm. So I'm more worried how uh, uh, the European Union will invest in green hydrogen, but will try uh, to sustain all the supply chain in Europe to be part of these investments and to, to, to be a more and more leader worldwide in this business. And from this point of view, uh, we had uh, even some, let's say, bad uh, experiences in the past, like we have been talking about solar energy. Uh, Europe was leader in solar energy and we lost completely uh, the, 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 the production of the technologies connected to the solar energy because everything went to China and we were not able, not interested, I don't mm -hmm. care, uh, to, to provide any kind of support uh, to the European industry from this point of view. So I would not uh, like to see again this mistake to happen. Uh, and I would like really uh, to see the huge investment that we have to do to incentivize, to subsidize uh, the green hydrogen anyway, to create value inside, inside Europe uh, as well, not only in terms of having a, a more sustainable environment that is, of course, important, but uh, in order even to, to create, to sustain a new industry that is already there and has all, all, all the chances to, to be there uh, in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's very important. Uh, and more in particular, regarding your organization, uh, I'm sorry if I take all this time from you. Uh, regarding FREEM uh, uh, ESG scores, uh, uh, which factors do you think uh, contribute the most uh, to achieving the best results in terms of positive impact uh, for the environment at uh, your organization? I'm talking about in particular, you know, things like uh, scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, or in particular, uh, you know, um, waste uh, production or uh, reduction of energy usage, water consumption, climate mitigation, and biodiversity, or uh, all the things related to the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, uh, which way do you think that uh, your company in particular uh, um, is having an uh, important impact uh, on this side in terms of both social and environmental governance uh, um, you know, uh, any particular the or the corporate social corporate social responsibility and sustainability uh, materiality assessment. How do you? F what is your impression? Uh, what are the the uh, advancement that you see on that side? Yeah. So uh, let's say we we are a, a relatively small entity. So of course some of these. Uh, uh, important uh, uh, topics uh, we are addressing uh, or we have been starting uh, to, to address uh, in, in the last years, let's say. In terms of social responsibility uh, and this kind of behavior, it's a little bit more natural in, in, a small, uh, in a small business and in a family business because, of course, you have this kind of, let's say, straight uh, and human approach uh, mm -hmm. Uh, compared to other multinational company. Uh, uh, talking about DSG is, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's going to be a key factor, uh, even because we decided that the, the uh, energy transition is, is our strategic market. And of course, uh, there is focus uh, on, on the supply chain on, on, this, on these topics. And uh, let's say com completely uh, in, in, accord to, to, in accord to what I mentioned before, I I, I would really appreciate if there is still 
in, in the supply chain there is uh, uh, there are strict let's say policies in terms of uh, achieving these ESG targets uh, because this is a way in which uh, uh, our companies can can differentiate in, in a positive way compared to other uh, uh, other countries uh, and other uh, let's say part of the world um, in which of course uh, some uh, of these uh, uh, topics are not let's say so uh, so important um, in, in our production let's say we don't have uh, a very let's say uh, strict requirements today in terms of environmental impact and so on and our production is uh, let's say quite uh, light from this point of view uh, nevertheless uh, uh, we, uh, we we already uh, we will have uh, this year in uh, for 2023 we will uh, have for the first time a, an ESG report available for the company so it's the first uh, let's say formal step in, in this sense uh, and we will set up uh, in the next uh, few years even our let's say um, more formal uh, ESG uh, let's say balance sheet and uh, um, if for regarding the product or the production, um, let's say none of uh, scope one, scope two, and scope three are, are really, let's say, heavy. Uh, we are almost working on, on all. Mainly, we are focusing on scope one uh, at, uh, as of today. And we already set up several, uh, let's say, small things but in order to to go in the, in this direction and uh, but we are moving even for uh, for scope 2 and uh, and scope 3 as well that uh, will come uh, will come in the future so <clears throat> it's uh, in, in um as, as mentioned before, it's in the, pi it's in the pipeline. <laughs> it's, it's in the pipeline and uh, uh, must be a, a driver uh, for uh, for us, uh, but must be a driver, I think, uh, uh, of differentiation for for the European uh, industry as well. So everything everything should be. Uh, I, I, it's, it's part of the roadmap. Just thank you very much, Mulevain. So I, I I really have a final final. Final, final question for you is, uh, since you are doing uh, most of your business globally, internationally, you're really one of the major, although not a big company, you're one of the major global international players, global player, and you work and you do your revenues yourselves, mostly internationally, you know, 90 plus percent of your sales are international, uh, operating all over the world. Uh, and you are on a daily basis uh, used to, since the case, to do business uh, uh, with the uh, international market, you're sort of a born global, as they call it, uh, company uh, uh, with a big mission commitment to international markets. So you do business, uh, you engage in business uh, transactions with international players every day. How do you uh, practically manage uh, the selection of your international markets in general, uh, you know, your your feasibility study or decision to, well, now this we're going this country, that country, we, we expand here or there uh, in the different uh, business, you know, green, uh, hydrogen, rather than uh, um, uh, uh, converters, whatever. Uh, when you take decisions like, I'm going to go and open my business in this and that country, uh, looking for new opportunities, uh, uh, what are you really, in general, as a methodology, you know, uh, to, to know you specifically, uh, uh, your detailed activities, but what is a methodology? What, what are you really looking at? What's on your radar? You know, you look at, uh, uh, you know, um, subsidies, uh, uh, fi sustainable finance opportunities and market the potential, um, complementarities between your capabilities uh, and the demand of the local market, the local competitive pressure, uh, the economic fundamentals of the countries. Uh, what are the factors that you really take into consideration when you put together your case study, your feasibility study in selecting new international market expansion? Uh, projects. So, how, since you do it regularly, because you do business mostly globally, how do you go about? What are the key elements uh, on your on on your you know checklist that you look for when you select and assess and select uh, new markets to grow? This is just a methodological question, but it's always very interesting to know a big international player how they do select uh, international markets. Yeah. So, 
Uh, basically, um, we, um, we work uh, in really in several countries worldwide. Uh, we have installed our equipment in more than 90 countries worldwide. Um, and, and so from this point of view, uh, uh, we, let's say we are used to, to, to have this kind of uh, uh, business uh, in, in, in different countries with different cultures. Uh, in terms of selecting uh, the markets, uh, being a, a small company, a small entity anyway, uh, we, of course, we, uh, we start maybe uh, from a top-down, let's say, analysis, so trying to have uh, uh, the insights or the, prospect, the, the, the prospections of the market, uh, and even in terms of uh, the, the, the country, the risk of the country, and let's say the environment uh, in terms of uh, business and uh, possible, let's say, industrial presence inside this country. But then uh, we rely a lot uh, on a bottom-up uh, uh, analysis. So typically, uh, we, we try to have a, a direct or straight experience uh, in these markets in order to uh, understand uh, how far is from our way and our culture and, and our values. Uh, from this point of view, uh, the, the main driver uh, is typically the let's say the market opportunity uh, mm. this is of course the main the main market uh, and then basically depending on, on 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 the size of the market opportunity we can decide whether uh, having a sort of investment or presence or another one so if it is just okay maybe we rely on a local agent a local partner uh, as we do in several several countries or uh, uh, we set up even maybe uh, a, uh, foreign a subsidiary, a subsidiary with uh, uh, maybe different uh, level of uh, uh, structure in terms of sales support, after sales support, and so on. And so the, 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 the bigger, let's say, the market or the bigger are the opportunities, of course, the higher can be the, uh, the kind of investment. The, the second main driver, so one is, of course, the market opportunity because, uh, of course, we, we really try to have this from, from the very beginning. We have been always very cautious in, in making investment and doing step-by-step -step investments. So, so that's why, let's say, this bottom-up uh, approach uh, has always been, let's say, the, 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 uh, the main one. <clears throat> the, the second driver is, of course, uh, how far... Uh, is this market uh, compared compare to, to free and positioning? So um, how much can free and be accepted in the market uh, in terms of brand, in terms of product, and so on? And so the, the other main uh, driver is uh, uh, how far it, it is. So in, in some countries or in some areas, you may have uh, maybe huge potential, but the gap to be covered are too big. And so maybe we, in the past, we decided to go in other countries where maybe the market opportunity was smaller, but the gap uh, seemed to be uh, smaller. And uh, yeah. so this, uh, uh, this is, let's say, a mix uh, uh, between opportunity and gap, let's say, to be covered, uh, which is uh, then... Uh, very interesting because, of course, this sort of analysis are then driving all the project. If we decide then to to set in a country uh, from from really this uh, this, this first analysis, you set up all uh, all the action plan to to cover the gap. Absolutely. So you you may decide to go for a green field or brown field or understanding the institutional voice. Anyway, you have to work on also the. Uh, uh, country risk and all the, um, you know, opportunity versus the, the, the uh, uh, you know, uh, complementarities or the uh, synergic opportunities or the, um, uh, you know, potential uh, threats that you might uh, yeah. encounter. Yeah, uh, that's very interesting. Really, very interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask this question because it's always very exciting uh, to, 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 to understand how companies uh, think and plan when they assess and evaluate uh, 
uh, market opportunities internationally and what are the key factors they actually mm -hmm. considering both on the uh, uh, hard data and uh, let's say more soft uh, uh, cultural and uh, uh, you know um, other aspects that may be considered in the in the assessment. Yeah, so for, from this point of view, it, in your question, you were mentioning even incentives uh, for us uh, would be a second step. So mm -hmm. we are not going in, into a country because there are incentives. We are going into a country because we decided that this is the right uh, the right way. And then we look maybe for incentives if, uh, if these are available. This can impact maybe more on how much you invest or how fast you grow. But uh, usually, uh, this is not uh, a main driver for uh, selecting uh, for selecting a country. Yeah, yeah, of course, and there is a big consideration about whether it's just a, a marginal business or whether it's a strategic long-term business. So you might want to go with a subsidiary, with a PI, with a more direct presence. If the country is worth uh, uh, the investment in the long run, it's a higher potential. So that's very interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Lorenzo, you've been extremely uh, uh, kind to dedicate all this time to to to, to us and to explain all this beautiful, uh, uh, you know, uh, vision uh, about the future of uh, energy and uh, sustainability and sustainable energy and the future of uh, uh, your your company. So I, I thank you very much. Really, thanks a lot for this incredible uh, analysis, and I look forward to. Uh, uh, meeting you again and, uh, and continue these conversations and uh, to learn more, much more again about uh, how your company is able to internationalize and where do you see the market going in the years to come. Thank you very much and have a great you, uh, 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 continuation of your activities and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you very much, Ivo. It's been uh, great talking to you okay. and of course I'm, you know, always available and uh, and excited talking about these uh, these matters that are part of our uh, of our life. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for your great contribution, Rian, and your time. It was very appreciated. Thank you Thanks. very much. Talk to you soon. Bye. 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 Take care.